Summary of the Hot Zone by Richard Preston In the beginning of the hot zone, Charles Monet, a Frenchman who lives in western Kenya, tells his story. In January 1980, he chooses to check out Kaidam Cave, a natural feature on Mount Elgon's peak. After a week, he gets sick with a fever and starts throwing up. He gets so sick that he has to be taken to the Nairobi hospital. He keeps throwing up on the plane, and when he gets to the hospital, he starts bleeding and pukes all over a doctor named Dr. Shem Musok. Monet dies not long after, and Dr. Musok gets sick not long after that. All of his organs start to break down, and his blood won't clot. Dr. David Silverstein, who is his doctor, sends a sample of his blood to a lab in South Africa and to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. They tell him that he has the Marburg virus, which first appeared in Germany in 1967 after plant workers were introduced to monkeys with the disease. Author Richard Preston tells us that Marburg kills one in four of its victims, which is a huge number. It is related to two dangerous diseases called Ebola Sudan, which kills 50% of its victims, and Ebola Zaire, which kills 90% of its victims. These viruses hit every organ in the body and cause both a lot of bleeding and blood clots that can kill. Marburg is spread to people by monkeys, just like AIDS. Like AIDS, it is usually only spread through direct contact with blood and bodily fluids. Dr. Shem Musok starts to feel better out of the blue, and no one else gets sick. His blood is sent to labs around the world so that the virus can be studied. The U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, USAMRIAD, which is also called the Institute, is one of the places that will get the money. Preston takes us back to 1983 and tells us about Nancy Jocks, who at the time was a major, and her husband Jerry Jocks, who are both vets in the U.S. Army. Nancy works in a level 4 laboratory at USAMRIAD. This means that she wears a spacesuit when she works with diseases that have no vaccines or treatments. Eugene Johnson, who goes by Jean, is in charge of Ebola study at the Institute. He has been looking for Ebola for decades, while most experts are too afraid of the virus to work with it. He gives monkeys Ebola Zaire, using a type from a nurse named Mayinga who has since died, and then tries to heal them. When the cures fail, which they always do, it is Nancy's job, along with that of her boss Colonel Anthony Johnson, Tony, to cut up the monkeys. After putting on a spacesuit, which was hard work, Nancy and Tony went into the hot zone to start their study. They keep going until Tony sees a tear in Nancy's outer glove, they both wear three layers. She rushes out of the room and is terrified to see that the blood has gotten to her interior glove, but not her hand. She only just avoided being found out. The experiment is over soon after this, but not before Jean and Nancy find out that Ebola can change and spread through the air. Preston talks about how Ebola spread in Sudan in 1976, which was made worse by the fact that patients were given injections with dirty needles, and how Mayinga died from Ebola in Zaire. He talks about how a group of American doctors found the Ebola virus and went to Africa to treat it and learn more about it. In 1987, Jean Johnson gets blood samples from a dead Danish boy named Peter Cardinal, who was 10 years old. He finds that the blood has Marburg in it and is shocked to learn that Peter, like Charles Monet, has been to Kaidam Cave. It's clear that the virus is hiding somewhere in the cave. Jean Johnson tries a big experiment to find out where the water is coming from in the cave, but he fails. At the same time, both Nancy and Jerry get promotions and become lieutenant colonels. Nancy takes over as head of the pathology department at USAMRIAD, and Jerry takes over as head of the veterinarian department. In 1989, we move to Reston, Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. The Reston Primate Quarantine Unit is a place in Reston where monkeys that will soon be sent to labs across the U.S. are kept. Veterinarian Dan Dalgard is in charge of it. In October, he starts to notice that an unusual number of monkeys seem to be dying. By November, the mystery disease is still spreading, so Dalgard chooses to talk to the Institute. He sends samples to a scientist named Peter Jarling, 
who then sends them to an employee named Thomas Geisbert to be looked at with a strong electron microscope. The two are surprised to find that almost all of the cells in the samples are dead. They take a whiff of the culture to check for pollution, but they don't smell anything. People start to think that the virus is probably simian hemorrhagic fever, which kills monkeys but doesn't hurt people. When the cells are finally ready to be looked at under an electron microscope, Geisbert makes a shocking discovery, whatever is making the monkeys sick is a phylovirus, and both he and Jarling may have been exposed to it. They find Gene Johnson right away and go with him to tell Colonel Clarence James Peters, CJ, but they don't tell him that they might be found out. They tell Dalgard that something might be wrong and keep looking into the virus. Jarling finds out that the virus is either Ebola Zaire, which is the most dangerous type of phylovirus, or a very close relative. The news goes up the chain of command, and the men tell both Colonel David Huxel, who is in charge of Usamriad, and Nancy Jocks. He then gets in touch with Major General Philip K. Russell, who is in charge of the Institute. The group decides that they need to tell Dalgard, the local officials, the Pentagon, and the CDC. Dan Dalgard, on the other hand, stays cool until he hears that one of his employees, Jarvis Purdy, had a heart attack, which he thinks might have been caused by Ebola. A team from Usamriad goes to the monkey house to get samples and bodies. The team then goes back to the institute. Nancy starts to cut up the bodies while CJ, General Russell, Gene Johnson, and Dan Dalgard talk about what to do in a big meeting. After some trouble with the CDC, especially with the smart but short-fused Dr. Joseph B. McCormick, who is one of the few people on Earth who has actually treated people with Ebola, the group decides that the army will be in charge of killing the sick monkeys. CJ gets in touch with Jerry Jocks, who will also be part of the plan. Jerry starts making plans with Gene Johnson. He wants to kill the animals in a gentle way while making sure that the people and his team are safe. After a day of planning, the operation starts in complete secret so that the press doesn't find out and the public doesn't freak out. Soldiers put on spacesuits and start killing sick monkeys, which is a dangerous job because the monkeys have sharp teeth and could spread the disease. Some of the dead animals, whose bodies were mostly killed by the virus, are taken apart by Nancy. Milton Frantig, who works at the monkey house, starts throwing up. He is rushed into an ambulance right away. Dan Dalgard thinks that he has to let the army kill all of the monkeys in the house because any of them could be sick. Jerry puts together a group of young soldiers who will go into the building, kill the monkeys, and take samples. As the troops catch, inject, and cut up hundreds of monkeys, the process is hard, dangerous, and horrible. Still, it mostly goes well, though there are a few close calls when news cars try to drive by and check it out. But on the second day, a monkey gets away, and Jerry can't catch it until the next day. Peter Jarling, meanwhile, checks Milton Frantig's, Tom Geisbert's, and his own blood for Ebola, but none of the men seem to have it. After the process is over, a team starts to clean up the building by killing every living thing inside it. The whole thing has made people wonder, if this disease is Ebola Zaire, why haven't any people gotten sick? After a few months, more monkeys are brought in, and another wave of Ebola hits the monkey house, putting another worker at risk of getting sick. This time, the army decides to let the monkeys die out because the virus doesn't seem to be a big threat to people. Soon after, however, it is found that Jarvis Purdy, Milton Frantig, and two other Reston workers have the virus in their blood, but they have no symptoms. This means the virus can spread through the air, but it doesn't hurt people. Ebola Reston is the name of the fourth type of the virus. It's almost the same as Ebola Zaire, but it can spread through the air and doesn't hurt people. But a small change to its genetic code could make this virus very dangerous. Preston plans to go to Kaidam Cave on his own in August of 1993. He drives with a guide and some friends along the Kinshasa Highway and talks about how the building of the highway made it possible for HIV to spread. In other words, AIDS is a sign that the world is getting smaller. When the group gets to Kaidam Cave, Preston puts on a simple spacesuit to protect himself from a virus that might be inside. 
he goes into the cave and is amazed by its beauty and mystery, but at every turn he sees the chance of getting sick. He comes out and quickly cleans and throws away everything he wore, but he is still scared that he might have gotten Marburg. Preston thinks about how the destruction of the tropical environment by people might be linked to the spread of tropical viruses like Ebola and HIV. He wonders if these viruses are nature's way of fighting off the parasitic infection of the human race. He also thinks that one day, a virus even deadlier than HIV could come along and wipe out all humans. Preston goes on one last trip, this time to an old monkey house in Reston that has been left empty. Inside, he sees plants and bugs coming back to life in a place where a dangerous virus used to live. He thinks that Ebola is no longer around for the time being. But, he says, it will be back. About the author. Richard Preston grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. He went to Pomona College and Princeton University for his college education. He became interested in nonfiction and journalism and wrote a number of nonfiction books and pieces before his story, Crisis in the Hot Zone, was published in The New Yorker in 1992. After choosing to turn the piece into a book, he wrote The Hot Zone, which quickly became a bestseller. Since then, Preston has continued to focus on scientific problems. He has written books about getting rid of smallpox, the redwood forest, and the steel business. In 2014, the terrible Ebola breakout in West Africa put the hot zone back on the list of best-selling books. During this time, Preston also turned back to Ebola. He did a lot of talks about the disease and wrote about it for The New Yorker. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.